All right, we are about ready to start class this morning, and we're going to be in Daniel chapter 10. Uh, But before we begin class this morning, we will have a word of prayer. Uh, Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to you for all of the blessings you give us. We're thankful to you for your word and for how you reveal all these events that take place and how you've shown us the way of life, a way that we might not have thought of on our own. We would not have thought of on our own, Father. But you showed us the way of life nonetheless. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to always take that way of life, to always seek out your Son, Jesus Christ, as our source of true sustenance and our our hope. Help us not to be conformed to the ideas and the mindsets of this world, but rather to focus on those things of the next world, the heavenly things. Help us to put our mind on things above so that we may someday be with you where Christ is seated at your right hand. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Right, Daniel chapter 10. And um, we're going to go ahead and plunge into this. Uh, If there are no... I realize, of course, not everybody was here for the coverage of the 70 weeks in the latter part of chapter 9, but all those recordings are online, so uh, we're going to move on to chapter 10. And Daniel chapter 10 is actually the start of the last vision in the book. So, pretty good. But Daniel has 12 chapters because the vision actually extends through chapter 10 and through chapter 11 and through chapter 12. And it the whole all three chapters together comprise one vision. You might say that it would be... I mean, you might wonder, I guess, why it wouldn't be a single chapter... Uh, And the reason why is because then it would be insanely long and people aren't comfortable with chapters that are that long, apparently. And in fact, Daniel 10 through 12, even though it is a single vision, makes up a quarter of the book by itself. So, there you go. Uh, And chapter 10, really, uh, is more of a kind of an introduction to the vision, the real meat of the vision, uh, the the real prehistorical predictive stuff is not until chapter 11. Um, but as we uh, get into this, we're going to go ahead and just start reading the text, chapter 10, and um, we'll see what we can learn from it. Uh, so I can even volunteer to read the first nine verses of chapter 10. falling asleep in angelic vision again. All right, so we'll we'll start with this. Um, Daniel is fasting, and we talked about fasting uh, on the Q and A last week. Um, But we'll notice that Daniel uh, he also been fasting in chapter nine as well. Uh, Why 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 is Daniel fasting? For what? Why would he be mourning right now? Okay, there's kind of a desire to go back to Jerusalem, right? Uh, Now, when does this vision take place? 
the third year of Cyrus. And when did the first wave of captives go back to Jerusalem? That's a little bit more... Got to know what another part of the Bible says. <laughs> when, was the, when, when, when did Cyrus say, Hey, y'all can go back now? <laughs> It would have been 539, but uh, according to the Scripture, in Ezra chapter 1, in verse 1, what year of Cyrus did that happen in? I'm sorry? In the first year of Cyrus. Okay, so Daniel has this vision in the third year of Cyrus. But the decree was issued in the first year of Cyrus. Uh, so the decree's already been issued. And, I mean, Cyrus has already said, you can go back. And it may be that the first wave of captives has really already returned to Jerusalem by this point. Uh, so it, it raises a got kind of a question as to why Daniel is fasting, you know, if he's still praying about the uh, the situation with the return from exile in Jerusalem. Uh, there's another there's another interesting point to note is uh, what day it is when he has this vision in the 24th day of the first month. Now we might just gloss over that and not really think much of it. And the reason why is because their calendar doesn't mean the same thing to us that it meant to them. So maybe if we translate it into a modern day analogy, if I were to if if I if it were December twenty eighth, and I were to tell you I just got done fasting for three weeks, what would you notice? Huh? Huh? Well, my appearance, okay, but you know, think think in terms of the calendar, okay? I missed Christmas. I missed, uh, yeah, I missed Christmas dinner. Exactly. If it's December twenty eighth and I've been fasting for three weeks, I missed Christmas dinner. Now, Daniel, he says it's the twenty fourth day of the first month, and he's been fasting for three weeks. What? What does anything happen on the first day? On the fourteenth day of the first month? This is the Jewish calendar thing. 14th day of the first month was Passover. So if he's been fasting for three weeks, what did he just miss? He just missed Passover. He missed the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, okay, yeah, so, so, now that, that, that's striking. And the readers of Daniel would have picked up on that instantly, like, wait a second, he, he just skipped over that? Uh, but he just missed, I mean, because Passover runs from the 14th to the 21st. Daniel's on the 24th, he says, I've been fasting for three weeks. Um, now, technically, what do you need? To, one of one of the things you need to celebrate Passover, in its fullest sense, is you need the temple, uh, so that you can offer the sacrifices. But since there is no temple still standing because it hasn't been rebuilt yet, you know, it's like the observation of Passover is, you know, missing. What was Passover even about? What was it designed to commemorate? Hmm? Leaving Egypt. Well, from their vacation in Egypt or their captivity in Egypt, right? Okay, it's a uh, the Passover is about release from bondage. Israel still finds herself in exile even after the decree has been issued, even after uh, Daniel has been told about the rebuilding of the temple and the restoration of the city and all those things. Now that she still finds herself in exile, and Daniel still sees it as compelling, even after all this time, to pray and to fast over this issue. Uh, now, he has this vision, and the vision is one of great conflict. Uh, and, you know, that, that's a grammatical ambiguity in verse 1. Uh, it can mean that the vision was about a great conflict, which is technically true, or it could mean that the vision caused Daniel much distress, which apparently also is true. Um, 
And it says he had an understanding of the vision. He fasts. Uh, and it doesn't really describe much uh, here. I guess, what, what does he see in this vision? A man. Okay. Now let's, let's write these details down. Let's talk about what it is. All right, we have a man. Okay, where's linen? I'm sorry? Belt of gold. What else? Hmm? Body was like, body like barrel. Uh, Face like lightning. Eyes like fire. Use up this marker before the day is out. I'm sorry, what was that last bit? Arms and feet of bronze. Blah. Can't write today, huh? Okay. Booming voice. Voice. Uh, I think the, the New American Standard says it's a voice like a tumult <laughs> or something like that. It's loud, in other words. All right. Did we get, did we get all the details? Are we missing anything? I think that's it. Well, I think that gets it. Let me, but, um, I mean, there's probably more things you can get into it. All right, so he's dressed in linen, um, and in the ancient world, the the ancient people would ordinarily bleach the linen so it was white, so we're probably safe in assuming that this is a white garment. Uh, Ezekiel has a similar vision of a man of linen. Uh, linen, was also, linen was also worn by the high priest whenever he went into the sanctuary on the Day of Atonement. Uh, a lot of... Oh, Keith has come back with markers. All right. Oh... How badly invisible is this from everybody else's perspective? Huh. All right, thank you. All right, so where was I? All right, yeah. So the the high priest would also wear linen on the day of atonement when he went into the most holy place. Uh, he did not wear his high priestly robes when he went in to atone for himself. He wore linen, which would have been more like a plain white garment. Uh, Interesting, you know, people always talk about dressing up to go into the presence of the Lord, but the high priest is actually required to dress down to do that and remind himself that he is a commoner. Uh, the belt of gold, the gold of Uphaz. We don't know where Uphaz is. In fact, we're not even really sure if Uphaz is a place. Um, some people suggest it just means Paz, which meant that the gold was fine. Um, he had a body like beryl. Kind of a gemstone-like thing. Face like lightning, eyes like fire, feet like bronze, voice like a tumult. So what does this look like, I guess? What is this? Do we see this kind of thing anywhere else in the Bible? Anybody who wears golden belt, and has eyes of fire and bronze feet and other things like that. Any other passages in the Bible that look like this? Hmm? Revelation. Okay, yes, there is a passage in Revelation. And who is described in these terms in Revelation? The Son of Man. And that is Jesus, right. Now, th- this passage is very similar to the one in Revelation 1. And so, as a result, some people have suggested that the man in linen is actually really Jesus. Um... Does that hold up? Depends what this man does. What does he do? Well, actually, you know, it might help if we, it might help if we kept reading a little bit. But um, a couple of other interesting details about this uh, was Daniel all alone when he had this vision. 
They didn't see it. They were scared. Okay. Now, does that sound like anything else we read in the Bible? Yeah, it sounds kind of like Saul on the road to Damascus. Uh, you know, he heard the voice. He saw um, the people around them. They heard the voice. They saw the light, but they didn't see or Jesus, and they didn't understand him. Uh, Daniel, they, they run away, and Daniel's left all by himself. And this is a recurring theme. Daniel loses his strength and turns pale again. Uh, we've seen this several times in Daniel's visions up to this point, and we're seeing it again here in chapter 10. Uh, the sound of the voice, Daniel falls to the ground into a deep sleep. And this is going to... Uh, trying to exp- And the angel tries to explain things to Daniel, but Daniel keeps collapsing from fatigue, and we're going to see that more as we go through. Uh, let's look at verses 10 through 21. Uh, somebody read verses 10 through 21 here. Okay. All right, so after reading that, what do we think of the theory that this is Jesus? <laughs> yeah, notice several elements of this. Verse 11, the figure is sent. Uh, verse 13, he has been withstood by the prince of Persia. It's hard to imagine Jesus being withstood by anybody. Um the figure needed help from Michael in verse 13. It's hard to imagine that as a, an issue as well. And verse 21, There is no one who stands firmly with me with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. Uh, you know That doesn't sound like this angelic being is claiming to be God or the Son of God or anything like that. And in fact, the comparison with Revelation 1 comes up short because in Revelation 1... Jesus says something that this angel does not say. He says, I am the first and the last. Uh, And he makes these other Christological claims for himself, divine claims for himself, which this angel does not make. Uh, And, I mean, the very real, I mean, the very simple explanation, one wonders, well, if they are different, why the similarities? Because it appears that John is going out of his way in Revelation to compare uh, Jesus with this angelic figure. Why would they? Why? Why the similarity if they are different? Hmm. Okay, heavenly beings, right? So it's clear. It's clear that it says it's a man, but it's clearly more than just a man. Uh, I've never seen a man that looks like this. Uh, you know, what, what was the purpose? What was the purpose of this angel coming to Daniel? Why is he here?
so he can understand the vision he saw. And he's going to make some kind of, you know, basically he's revealing information. And what was the purpose of Jesus coming to John in Revelation 1? What did Jesus come to do in Revelation 1 when he appeared to John on Patmos? I'm sorry? Right, we revealed to him. It was, as hint, hint, is the clue is actually in the name of the book, Revelation. He revealed something. Uh, yes, that's correct. The... Um, you know, he he shows up to again. Same thing the angels doing, revealing a vision, uh, revealing information, and I mean, you know, it, it's not at all. I mean, you think about it. You know, angels revealed things in old times. Christ reveals things in the current times. It's like Hebrews chapter one says, God, uh, you know, God after He spoke long ago in the Father to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days, has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. He talks about, you know, God revealed Himself in a lot of different ways in Old Testament times, but now He reveals Himself through Jesus, His Son. Uh, One of the ways God revealed Himself was angels, and it's not a coincidence that the bulk of Hebrews chapter 1 is about why Jesus is better than the angels. Uh, you know, there's a superiority because he starts, he leads with that this idea of revelation Um, angelic beings may represent God's power and glory, but they are not God and they may appear in this you know, grandiose, terrifying fashion, but they're not to be confused with God himself Uh, and now here's where we get to the, the angelic conflict and it's made difficult Because Daniel keeps falling asleep. Why does Daniel keep falling asleep, by the way? Does he get bored? Because he hasn't had enough to eat for three weeks? Uh, uh, That might be part of it. (laughs) Yeah, he's losing his strength. Well, that's what happens when you fast. I just never forget the time we were in a Bible class on Esther and, you know, somebody... She had been fasting for three days. She goes into the king to request help for her people and instead she asks for a banquet. And the teacher asks, why did she ask for a banquet instead? Somebody piped up and said, well, it's because she was hungry, of course. Uh, she'd been fasting for three days. What would you do? Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes the very obvious answer <laughs> might be correct, actually. Um, okay, so there is some of that. But, of course, there's the other side of it, too. You know, when angels appear to people, what typically winds up happening? Oh, hey, good to see you. Yeah, well, wait, let's, uh, let's sit down and chat. Is that what... Fear, exactly. Angels aren't angels aren't these cute little babies with wings that you see in greeting cards. They're terrifying. They scare people. They're usually no, they're not usually no. That's true. In the Bible, angels are always described in the masculine. Um, I'm sorry. They can appear as people. That's true. No, you see that as well. Uh, that comment that comes up, you know, Genesis 18, for instance. These three men come to Abraham. He shows them hospitality, and it becomes very clear as the vision progresses that they are more than just men, even though they eat and drink all this other stuff. Yep. You know, I, sometimes people are like, well, sometimes people will say, "Oh, you know, angels are spiritual beings; they can't take physical form," which is demonstrably wrong because. You know, all you have to do is look at all of the times angels take human form in the Bible to refute that. Uh, all right, so Daniel falls down. The angel explains his delay. A hand touches Daniel and sets him on his feet, which also is something that happens in Revelation one. And after telling Daniel to understand the words, he stands trembling. How does the angel describe Daniel? Well, that's what he tells him to do. Well thought of. Man of high esteem is what my Bible says in verse 11. Uh, We've seen that before too, actually, in chapter 9, in verse 23. Um, You know, Daniel was described as being highly esteemed, and that's why the angels have come to grant him the understanding of the vision. 
Why did why does Daniel get all of these angelic insights? Why is he so special? Well, because God apparently thought a lot of him. He's highly esteemed. It's funny, there was an ancient belief, because people read the book of Daniel, uh, there was an ancient belief that you could actually have angelic visions if you fasted long enough, just like Daniel. But did Daniel have the vision because he fasted? Why did he have the vision? Because he believed, because... Because he was chosen. Exactly. I mean, lots of people believe and don't have visions. But Daniel was chosen by God. He was, I mean, he was highly esteemed. God decided to show him this vision. Um, you know. So, but I mean, you have the, the, that kind of idea reflected in a passage like Colossians chapter 2, for instance. Uh, whenever Paul is telling people, uh, let no one act as your judge in respect to food or drink or in respect to a festival or new moon or Sabbath day things which are a mere shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And then verse 18, Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize and delighting in self-abasement and the... And this probably should be translated the religion of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. A lot of versions say worship of angels and they assume people at Colossians were actually worshiping angels. But perhaps a better way to understand it is this, again, this ascetic idea that people had that if you just deprived your body long enough, that you could have a vision. You could have a, you know, an angelic revelation. Paul says, don't get caught up in the religion of angels. Don't get caught up in this idea that you can somehow get uh, or have those types of things. You should be holding fast to the substance, which is Christ. Um, and it's the same thing with us. You know, we shouldn't. We talked about fasting in the Q and A on Sunday night. Uh, one of the purposes we listed for fasting is not to induce angelic visions, because I mean, because that's you know, fasting is something to be done because of mourning or because of sober reflection or because we're facing a difficult decision. But you don't fast for oh, so simply so you can get the supervision, become a super spiritual person. Well, you know, at that point you're not really fasting, for the Lord. You're fasting for yourself, and it probably won't work anyway. So, good luck with that. Um, now. After telling Daniel to understand the words spoken to him, he stands trembling. Uh, He's called man of high esteem. He's told not to be afraid, which, you know, everything about his reaction in this scene spells fear. Uh, It seems to prompt this kind of response. The angel also says something else, too. He came, verse 12, in response to Daniel's words. Uh, So, apparently... Prayer does do something, because the angels were an answer to prayer. There's a problem, though. You know, I mean, Daniel's been praying for a while. He's been praying for three weeks. And the angel didn't come when Daniel prayed. In chapter 9, when Daniel prayed, when did the angel come? How quickly? Hmm? It was pretty quick. What, what does it say in chapter 9? Hmm. Verse 23. When was the angel dispatched to answer Daniel's prayer? Yeah, the beginning of your supplications. In other words, you haven't even finished saying the prayer yet. I was dispatched with an answer. So, you know, the problem with an angelic response, the problem with God's responding to prayer isn't that, you know, it takes a long time for the Pony Express to get up there and come back down. That's not what's up. No. God can send responses instantaneously. So why wasn't this angel sent at the beginning of Daniel's supplication? Why did it take three weeks? What was he doing? Was he helping him? What does verse 13 say? He withstood me. Uh, he's been withstood. And then, I mean, he was only able to stop uh, withstanding him when Michael showed up to help. Alright, so that brings us to this other question. And this is this is one of the more interesting things in the Bible about angels. You know, I mean, whenever angels appear in the Bible, they're never actually the point of the passage they appear in. Um, but this is... This passage does kind of lift the curtain a little bit and tell us what's going on behind the scenes. And it would be a mistake to ignore what it says. Um, Alright, so let's ask this very basic question. 
Alright, so there's this prince of Persia, or the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Who is this person? What can we figure out about him? Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? Hmm. Okay, so what do we infer from that? He is a... Okay, alright. So the prince of Persia, the kingdom of Persia, is probably a bad guy. Alright? Now... I mean, are we talking about the guy that rules Persia? Are we talking about Cyrus here? Cyrus is fighting angels. Is that what this is? Hmm? It says prince. What does that mean? Who is this person? Hmm? Someone in the royal family? So someone in the royal family fighting an angel? Is that what's going on here? No. Are we on the wrong track, assuming it's human? I mean, we, we, we look at this. Okay, this guy here is described as a man. Right? But clearly he's more than just a man. This guy over here, he's a prince. Is he a human prince? Huh? You don't think so. Why not? Huh? Okay, alright, so I'll put this suggestion up here. Okay. Is a demon. Why in the world? Well, okay, alright. Now, I'm going to say, well, we're just we're wandering into the speculative zone here for a second. But not really. Here's what we know. Okay. We know that in. Alright. Do angels influence the nations? Mm -hmm. uh, is there some... Do, do they get involved in geopolitical conflicts? Hmm? Yeah, okay. Alright, do angels get involved in geopolitical conflicts? Well, yeah, I mean, you can find all sorts of places in the Bible where they do that. Uh, you know, like... In 2 Kings 6, the fiery host surrounds Elijah and his people. Um, God sent a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's prophets. That's clearly some kind of angelic being. Um, you know, you get all kinds of interactions here and there. In Revelation, depicts some geopolitical events as in terms of a war in heaven. Um, we struggle against spiritual forces of wickedness. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. Uh, you know, so there's all kinds of things like that. You know, Satan prevents Paul from coming to Thessalonica, First Thessalonians two, um, and on and on and on. We can go. You know, so it's not just God's angels that influence political events. Do demons get involved? Do evil forces get involved? Well, yeah, they do. You know, I mean, it's and it, it would be a mistake to assume that you know, well, Satan just doesn't do anything today. Well, no, he does stuff. Yeah, you know, and that's I think the part of the problem is people are afraid of being mistaken for you know, charismatic or anti-intellectual or whatever. I don't know what what the reason is, but this kind of stuff does happen, and the Bible depicts it as this reality. It's not an age of miracles thing. It's a angels are acting in this way thing. Angels are terrifying beings. All right, so I'm getting my notes out of order here. Okay. All right, so there's a couple of other things to note. Um, in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, there's a textual variant, which is probably the correct reading, that talks about how uh, when God divided up the nations, He set their boundaries according to the number of the sons of God, or the angels of God. 
uh, when the most yeah verse thirty Deuteronomy thirty two verse eight when the Most High gave the nations of their inheritance when He separated the sons of man He set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Uh, there's a textual corruption that says the sons of Israel, which uh, sometimes appears in there, but um, more likely what we're looking at is this interaction between uh, the pagan nations and the angelic beings. Um, and again, of course, who did the nations worship? Who did the Gentile nations worship? Idols. Hmm? Made of wood and stone, right? All right, and there any spiritual reality behind them whatsoever? For sure. Huh? Um, what was that? Okay, there would be bad forces involved in this. And, uh, you know, the, the Scripture talks about demons as well. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy 32 verse 17 well, in verses 16 and 17, they made him jealous with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known. Uh, Psalm 106, also another passage on this subject. Psalm 106, verse 34, they did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mingled with the nations and learned their practices and served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons and shed innocent blood, the the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. The land was polluted with the blood. That's Psalm 106, verses 34 through 38. And of course, Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as well, talks about this subject uh, when he says, um, but in verse 19, what do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything? Or an idol is anything? No, but I say that the things which Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. And there are other passages, of course, that you could go to talk about this subject. The idea that, you know, it's like the, the nations, they have their God, quote unquote, but their God is really a demon. And he's the one that's really influencing them. And so it's not hard to imagine this idea here. We get to Daniel 10. We know a couple of things. We know that whoever this angelic messenger was, this man in linen, he was being opposed by the prince of Persia. And, I mean, unless this is one of those Jacob wrestles the angels type scenarios, we're probably talking about a bad angel or a bad spiritual being or a demon or whatever you want to call it. In fact, does, it, does, a, does, some, does an angelic being have to be called an angel to be an angel? Is that the only word they ever use of it? Uh, well, you know, they call sometimes they're called sons of God. Sometimes they're called watchers. Uh, sometimes they're—I mean, the word angel means messenger. Sometimes they're called messenger. Sometimes they're just called a man. And I mean, this isn't the only place. Even in Daniel ten, he calls him a man. In Daniel nine. Uh, Daniel 9.21 refers to the man Gabriel, which you can figure out pretty quick that Gabriel is more than just a man. He's a heavenly type being. Um, So there's all sorts of terms that you can use to talk about these angelic beings. What tells us we're dealing with an angel is not terminology, but context. And in this context, it's pretty clear. Um, Now, alright, so he says, I've come... Because of your words. Alright, so not only is there a prince of Persia, there's also someone else. There's a prince of Greece. I wonder who the prince of Greece could be. Hmm? Yeah. You know, but let, let's look at this again. In verse 20. I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I'm going forth. Behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. Sounds scary. I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. In other words, I can't fight these guys without Michael's help. Oh, and also Michael is referred to as a prince. Your prince. Now is Michael a human? What is he? Michael, our angel. If it's the same one, well, you know, there's, again, we're dealing with the context here, and the context 
indicates that, you know, here we have this man in linen, belt of gold, body of barrel, all these things. He cannot oppose the prince of Persia unless Michael helps him. Now, Michael's a human being. You know, that doesn't really seem to... That, that, that leaves all sorts of head-scratching questions. What we're looking at, more likely, again, is we're lifting the curtain back, we're seeing what goes on behind the scenes, we're seeing these angelic conflict that takes place. Um, you know, something that goes on at the cosmic level. And if we're paying attention to context, you have the Prince of Persia, someone who appears to be bad, appears to be acting on the cosmic level to influence events. The Prince of Greece, who's probably in the same category. You know, we're dealing more than with just a man named Alexander. We're dealing with someone who this guy needs help against. This guy needs help to fight this guy. Now, if this guy's just Alexander the Great, you know, I don't know. This, this is small potatoes. But, this guy needs help against this guy. And that brings us to the third individual, your prince. Who is your prince? <laughs> hmm? Now, the angel has come. He will explain to Daniel what will happen in the future. And, one, one, and, of course, throughout all of this, Daniel keeps falling down and becoming speechless. And, you know, he's like, quit falling asleep while I'm trying to talk to you. Becomes speechless. The angelic figure touches his mouth, probably because of the speechlessness, um, similar to Isaiah 6, whenever the angel touches Isaiah's mouth with the hot coal. Daniel complains that he doesn't have uh, strength left. And the vision has brought Daniel anguish. How can Daniel, you know, a mere servant, talk with one such as, verse 17, my Lord? Uh, and I mean, when he says Lord, he's not saying he's not using the word the name of God, Yahweh. He's using the word Adonai in verse 17. Uh, the angel exhorts him not to fear. Peace be with you. Take courage. Be courageous. Uh, similar to Joshua 1 and verse 6. Not identical, but similar. And uh, Daniel's been strengthened. And so what happens now, and really kind of from verse 20 onwards is him describing what's going on here behind the scenes. And because the chapter divisions are terrible, uh, uh, we, have, we do have to, we can't miss the link between verses 20 and 21 in the next chapter. The angel, and in fact from 1020 all the way down to the end of 12.4, the angel speaks without interruption. He speaks about a conflict that the people of God are going to face, all the enemies they're going to, that are going to oppose them, and it is Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, who will arise in chapter 12 and verse 4. Chapter 12 and verse 1. At that time, Michael, the great prince, who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book of will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. <coughs> those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of the heavens. Those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. So, you know, he starts with this comment about the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece, Michael, your prince, who stands against these forces, and he ends the vision, he ends the speech talking about the same thing. No, uh, at that time, Michael will arise, there will be great tribulation, and then there will be some kind of a judgment in which those who had insight will live, and those who did not will be destroyed. You know, there was a kind of a resurrection passage. Now, in between, of course, you've got chapter 11, and you've got this long sequence of events that takes us from point A to point B. And we're not going to be able to cover that in this class, and probably not in the next class either, because there's a lot of stuff in chapter 11. <coughs> okay. All right. So the all right. So there's the being. And the being in the vision has to fight the prince of Persia. The prince of Greece is about to come. What is told uh, is inscribed. Verse 20, chapter 10, and verse 21 talks about how this stuff is inscribed in the writing of truth. It's like God wrote all this stuff down beforehand, before it happened. Uh, now, 
it's similar to chapter 12 and verse 1. Everything written in the book, everyone, everyone written in the book will be saved. Uh, one of the arguments that God makes in the Bible sometimes as to, you know, why is, why is your God so much better than the idols? And God says, because I can predict the future before it happens. You know, you couldn't have known that Cyrus would be the one to lead the people out of exile, you know, 150 years in advance. But I did, and I called it, and I said it, and I named him specifically. And that's, that's the whole point of Isaiah 44, is he's making this argument, God is superior to the idols because he can predict things that happen before him. Daniel 10, 11, and 12 makes kind of a similar approach, if you will. There's, a, there's the argument that, you know, who really withstands these forces? Well, God does, because He wrote down beforehand how this conflict's going to play out. Here you've got these princes, if you will, making war against the Lord's people. But He says, here, I'm going to show you the outcome. I'm going to show you every little detail... And you're going to see how it ends. And you're going to see how it plays out in the meantime. And that's what chapter 11 is for. It is essentially a blow-by-blow predictive account of what happens during the Greek period, if you will, the the conflict between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids and all of the different things. That's so much so that even people who don't believe the Bible is true will admit that, yes, these events are historically accurate. Uh, They just... Yes. Yes. Essentially, and if we get if if we're going to get anything out of chapter 10, that needs to be the main thing we get is that you know, the political events that we see around us are often shaped by spiritual events which we don't see. We don't understand. Can you tell? Can we tell what the events are going on in the background? Usually, no. Unless something like this happens, unless an angelic being actually shows up like this and tells you, and it'll be a scary experience, and you probably won't enjoy all of it. Uh, but that's something to keep in mind. Um, now, but we do know this sort of things going on. To say that angels influence world affairs is not speculation. It's simply a recognition of the biblical truth espoused in this chapter. Uh, And it's still true today. Our current struggle is with spiritual forces. And it really... I think think it ought to give us a message of comfort as well. Because, you know, regardless of how tumultuous the world will seem, and it gets really tumultuous in chapter 11, regardless of how messed up things seem to get, God saw it all coming... They're not throwing anything at him that he doesn't expect. And they're not throwing anything at him that he doesn't have a contingency plan for, that he doesn't have, that isn't part of the plan to begin with. And the end of that plan is already told to us resurrection from the dead. And in that sense, we ought to have comfort. We're out of time. I didn't, I have not said that. I have not said that. You are misquoting me. (laughs) What I said was that God has much bigger plans in mind than just this election. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, well, no...